Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. I'd like to give a very special thank you to the reformed members of this channel. Denise S., Seven Leaf Clover, Through Scrutiny, Samantha Place, Lisa Radford, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Mana Ash, Normie D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's Niece. If you would like to become a member and also find out what my GoFundMe is, all that information can be found down below. If you are new here or haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel grow and be pushed into the algorithm, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab your snacks, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Let's Not Meet Stories. Right after this intro an ad will play, I'll read the first story an ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Quick note, I will no longer be warning of listening discretion, instead it will be flashed on your screen, so look forward to that at the beginning of every video. Alright, on to the stories, shall we? When I first started escorting, I was completely clueless. I was desperate and usually would text with someone who got my number off of a site and arrange a meeting. These guys were usually married and we couldn't go to their place so we would do car dates. Real cheap whore shit. Before I knew what kind of money I could be making. Save the judgment because I don't really give an F. It's my job. Anyways, I get this text from a guy a few weeks in. He's early 40s, single, and a white male. He says he'd love to meet me, but just seems way too into it. But, desperate times. So I decide to meet him. I let someone know where I would be going and walk out of my apartment and to the back of the complex to meet him. I knew enough to know I didn't want him to know where I lived. He's not the guy in the pictures, but that happens. These guys want discreet. We go to the hotel. I start to undress and he talks to me. We sit on the bed and he tells me he wants me comfortable. I'm a tiny 5 foot 4, 120 pound woman. Anyone could honestly take me. He climbs on top of me and pulls the knife out in front of my face. It's my knife. He slid it out of my pocket. What is this for? Did you think you needed this? It wouldn't have helped. If I wanted to hurt you, I definitely could. I'm freaked the F out, but at this point, I'm pinned under this guy who is really short, but has a marine background and about 125 pounds on me. We finish the deed and I clean myself and get dressed. Our time has been up, but he keeps himself between me and the door. It's hella uncomfortable as he keeps telling me about things he could do if he wanted and that he would get away with it. I eventually make it home and say I won't see him again. But weeks later and I'm desperate again. I ended up having a three or four dates with this guy and got increasingly creepier and more possessive. I ended up telling him to lose my number and had to block him. Some of these men walking amongst us are true psychos. So, Ray Ray, I hope I never meet you again. So, let me get a couple things straight. Our little village was the kind of place where everyone knows everyone, and I could count the amount of houses on two hands. We were a really quiet and close-knit community, and nothing ever happened there. Proper out in the sticks stuff. One night, a few years ago, my mom and stepdad had gone out to this concert and left me in charge of my little brother and the dog. I wasn't very old, maybe around 14, 
and I felt really proud that my parents trusted me enough to do that. I thought I was a pretty cool brother, and I thought we'd be doing cool babysitter stuff like staying up late, eating pizza, etc. I'm kind of glad we did because I don't know what would have happened if we hadn't. At about 10.30, the power cut out. I didn't think anything of it because the weather hadn't been great lately, and I figured that had had something to do with it. I got some candles out of the cupboard and lit them, and put some of our favorite songs on. As soon as I sat back down, Sonny, my little brother, turned to me and, being the weird little kid that he was, told me very calmly that someone was outside. I was a little perturbed by him, but the dog hadn't done anything, so I presumed it was just the neighbors or something. He just shrugged and went back to his drawings. There's a running joke in our house that you don't need a clock with the dog around, because he is such a creature of habit that he will consistently keep up with exactly the same time every night to tell you that it's time to initiate his nightly go-to-bed protocol. It was about three quarters of an hour after the power went out when my dog decided that now was the time. I told Sonny to go get the dog his biscuit while I let him out for a piss. Now, our kitchen is an extension to the original house and, so as such, has a flat roof that's completely low to the ground compared to the rest of the house and offers easy access to the bathroom window. As I opened the door so the dog could do his thing, Sonny pushes past me in the doorway and whispers, I know you're out there, and I'm calling the police. As he turned around with the biggest, proudest smile you have ever seen on his face, there was a very distinct rustling coming from just above the doorway. I don't think I'll ever forget the way Sonny's face dropped when he looked just above my head. I looked up. The man sitting on the roof above me panicked tried to kick me, and then ran off into the next-door neighbor's garden and presumably into the cornfields surrounding our village. I was scared shitless, and Sonny was bawling his eyes out. I ushered him inside as quickly as I could and got a knife from the kitchen. We both went to his room, and I told him to try and get some sleep while I waited for our parents to come back. It was in agonizingly long four hours before they did. My stepdad immediately went outside to check to see if everything was all right. I heard them talking about how something had smashed the fuse box. Obviously we called the police, but they didn't come out until later that day. They did a search of the immediate premises and found a makeshift bed in a nearby disused barn along with pictures of silhouettes of us in the shower through the frosted glass. I think it's pretty safe to say the whole experience definitely shook us up. We moved out as soon as we could, but I still shut curtains whenever I can and I see shadows underneath every door I see. Sonny keeps quiet about it and I'm not sure if that's because his brain has cut it out or what. So yeah, weird kitchen roof stalker? Let's not ever meet again. I had an experience and never got around to telling my own story, which of course I never thought I would have to. Since it's long, I won't bother with a long intro. This is all you need to know. This happened in my senior year of college, and I lived off campus. I had two roommates in my apartment, townhouse kind of thing, named Natalie and Katie. Anyway, Katie was out that night doing homework in one of the school buildings, and I was awoken at 3 a.m. when I heard some knocking at the door downstairs. I thought that that was weird considering the hour, but I figured somebody had the wrong place and would realize and leave. 
The knocking didn't stop, though, and I lied in bed for a good several minutes, thinking, yeah, they'll go away now. They'll go away. They'll get bored. As one might expect, though, I started to grow confused and then kind of freaked out by this person's persistence. Then, the knocking turned into banging, and I couldn't ignore it anymore. Honestly, I probably should have called the police instantly, and it was the middle of the night, and I was just confused. So I headed up to the top of the stairs to see Natalie standing near the door, staring at it. Her room was on the bottom floor, so she had just walked up to it. We exchanged a baffled look because, what the hell, it's 3 a.m., this is weird. Natalie called out and asked them who they were and what they wanted. We're friends of Katie's, said the voice on the other side, who sounded male and about our age. We know her boyfriend, and we heard she was feeling down, so we came to surprise her. That was already a weird story because, again, three in the morning... But thankfully, Katie wasn't even home, so we both informed him of this. Katie's not here. She's off doing something else. Good. They're going to leave, right? They came here to see Katie. She's not here. They'll leave us alone, and we can go back to sleep. Mmm, just open the door. Look, I know, I know. If I hadn't called the police before, I definitely should have done it now. It was weird, though. That night, I realized why people do stupid stuff in horror films. Not only had I been woken up out of nowhere, but it feels surreal to be in a situation like this. Like there's no way you could actually be in danger. That only happens in horror movies and true crime documentaries and in questionable creepy stories online. I would never, ever thought it would happen to me. I'm just a random, ordinary, boring person going about my business. I don't need to call the police. I'm sure this will get cleared up and everything will be fine. So yeah, Natalie and I did the stupid thing and tried to argue with them. We told them that, again, Katie wasn't here. There was no need for them to stay. Eventually, Natalie asked what their names were. Throughout the encounter, we made out two distinct voices, but only one gave us a name, and I texted Katie without telling them, asking if she was friends with someone with that name. After a couple of minutes, during which we were still arguing with the stranger, Katie replied, I am, but I don't think she knows where I live. That wasn't good, but even worse... She? The person on the other side of the door had a male voice, so this was a real name, but not the real person. Whoever this was knew stuff about Katie, like who she hung out with. I told Katie to stay where she was and not to come back until we told her everything would be okay. Finally, we told the guys that if they didn't leave, we were going to call the police. No, 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 no. Don't call the police. No, don't call the police, okay? If we wanted to do something bad, we already would have done it, right? Yeah, that last bit wasn't helping their case. Just open the door, okay? The attempts at reasoning with them basically devolved into them telling us, just open the door. Just open the door over and over again until we finally actually did call the police. We hid in Natalie's room and dialed 911 and explained what was going on. Thankfully, there was a police station close by, so it wouldn't take them long to arrive. Unfortunately, I made the mistake of heading back into the living room and yelling through the door that we'd call the cops. But, contrary to what you might think, that actually didn't seem to scare them at all. They seemed only mildly upset, but 
They kept arguing. To this day, I can only assume that they just didn't believe us or something. Then, we heard a neighboring home's door swing open and a very pissed off man's voice. If you don't leave right now, I'm calling the effing police. For whatever reason, that was what caused them to freak out and they drove off. The police arrived and we told them the whole story. Natalie revealed that a couple of times, she had just barely peeked through the blinds of a window close to the front door. And she noticed that there were two guys, but only one of them was ever at the door at any given time. They would switch, with one at the door and the other sitting in the driver's seat of a parked car out front, presumably for getaway purposes. So, yeah, that's reassuring. They also hadn't looked drunk, according to Natalie, and they definitely hadn't sounded like they were drunk. There wasn't much the police could do besides sweep the area for a bit, but they told us that if the stranger showed up again to immediately call instead of engaging with them at all. One of the officers did give us some self-defense tactics and told us what kinds of household chemicals and items would work best for self-defense. After making sure everything was okay and reassuring us, they left, and we eventually called Katie and told her the weirdos were gone. She arrived and was, understandably, a bit shaken herself. We sat down and asked her who might have known where she lived. She did know people who had come to the apartment. Oh, some people. Certainly, but Natalie didn't recognize the guys outside or any previous visitors. Worse, it turned out that not only did they know Katie's friend's name, but they claimed to know her boyfriend, even though he didn't even live in the state where we were going to school. She swore up and down she didn't know anyone who would want to hurt her. By this point, it was around 5 a.m., so I didn't even bother going back to sleep since I was going to a workshop that morning. I told a lot of my classmates the story and it freaked them out too. And the entire day, Natalie and I jumped at every unexpected noise, every shadow, every random movement. That night, it was hard to sleep. I expected to hear knocking at the door at any second. Thankfully, they didn't come back. Ever. But that almost makes things more unsettling, in a way. I'll never, ever know what they wanted that night. Did they think we were hiding Katie? Was she seeing less than savory people in secret? Did they want to hurt her? If they did, why did they never give up and go looking for her elsewhere? Was all of that just an excuse to get into an apartment of a young woman? Did they want to kidnap us, hurt us, rob us? Who knows? I try not to let it bother me, but I wished I knew if my life was in danger that night. I have the feeling it might have been. After all, they weren't wearing face coverings. So if they wanted to commit a violent crime, they might want to get rid of the witnesses. But... Despite how much I wish I knew, yeah. Random strange men who insisted we let them inside for unknown reasons? Let's never meet again. Okay, this happened in 2016 when I was a 17-year-old, first-year college student in film school. I'm now 22, by the way. My name is Julia. I lived alone in my very first ever apartment. It was really small, but I was really proud of my independence. I never felt unsafe in this apartment for several reasons. There were multiple gates in the residence that needed to be opened through a code only the people who lived there knew. My door had three different locks, and it was right next to the university. So, most people who lived in the neighborhood were college students. Nothing bad had ever happened in the neighborhood before. 
I've always been very careful with locking the door when I leave my home. I always check twice. I have a slight OCD. So this one time, I leave to go to class and lock my door. But for some reason, I couldn't get the key out of the lock. It was completely stuck. So I went to get the caretaker of the building to help me. But he wasn't there, and I was getting late for class. So I went to class with the key still stuck in the lock. I took off the keychain first so it's not too noticeable. When I get home, the caretaker was back, so he came to help me, and we couldn't get it out for 15 minutes until somehow he did. He told me the lock was damaged, but that I didn't necessarily need to change it, if I only locked it once instead of twice. I just said okay, and that was the end of it. I really wasn't worried because of how safe I felt in the building. Flash forward to two months later. I was taking out the trash one night at around 11 p.m. while on the phone with my sister. I remember telling her that I was taking out the trash, then that I would take a shower afterwards before heading to a party. As I previously said, I always lock the door, even just to take out the trash. Because of my lock being damaged, I only locked it once. When I go back to my apartment, I found the door unlocked, which immediately alarmed me. So I went into the apartment and locked the door immediately, with three different types of locks. When you walk into my apartment, which is just 215 square feet, you have the main room in front of you and the bathroom immediately to your left. I had left the bathroom door slightly open, enough so I could see a man in my shower, turning his back to me. Naturally, when I saw this, I tried to open the door and leave as fast as possible, except my main lock was damaged from two months earlier and I couldn't open it no matter how hard I tried. In this moment, all I could think of was the fact that I had to leave as fast as possible. I jumped out the window without really thinking. I figured it was the only solution, except I lived on the second floor, so I completely smashed my ankles in the landing. I started running into whatever way I could, and when I got a little bit further from the building, I looked back and a man was there at my window watching me run away. I thought of two possible outcomes. Either the man was going to jump and chase me, except I wouldn't get far with my twisted ankles, or he would get scared of the height and be locked in my apartment. Thankfully, he picked option two. I went to hide in a bush a little further and I called the police, who arrived in just ten minutes because I lived close to the station. They pushed my door open and the man was there just sitting on my couch holding a kitchen knife waiting for me to come back, like he didn't think I would call the police. They arrested the guy later and told me that he had already been arrested for sexual assault, the R word, attempted kidnapping, and attempted murder. They also told me how everything had happened. Like I said, it was a very friendly neighborhood with mostly college students. So we got inside the building by other people holding the door for him. He then heard me telling my sister I was going to take a shower, which was why he was waiting in the bathroom for me. He crocheted my lock while I was taking out the trash. He apparently noticed me on school campus and followed me to my home several times before succeeding to actually come in. He stayed inside waiting for me because I had recently changed my phone and the previous one was still on the table, so he thought I didn't have a phone with me to call the police. I don't live there anymore, but after that, to get into the building, we all needed identification, proving we live there. Building IDs were created, and we had to scan them every time, and it was the only way to go in or out of the building. Nothing bad happened in the neighborhood after that, it's back to being very peaceful and friendly. 
So, to the guy who appeared to be wanting to take my life, I hope you are rotting in prison. This is the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. And what makes it worse is that, had things gone down differently, I might not be here today to tell this story. Okay, first things first. I'm a girl, about 5 foot 7 inches and around 130 pounds. This happened to me about 3 years ago, when I was in my early 20s and still a student, living in a very safe area. Growing up, I had loved martial arts and having grown up in a small rural town, I'd take what I could get. Karate? Fine. Judo? Sure. Kung Fu? Why not? Taekwondo? Sign me up. I loved martial arts. And I still do, by the way. Because they helped me discipline my mind and my body and grow my confidence. It had been a few years since I moved out to my country's capital to study, and I had kind of fallen off of the martial arts wagon at that point, with college taking up most of my time. I should also mention that at the time, I lived with my younger brother and our cat. We lived on the first floor, the second floor for all my American people right next to a military camp and a patch of forest which leads to a creek. On our back balcony, there was a circular metal ladder that would lead up to our balcony and the kitchen door, which, of course, we always kept under lock and key, except for when the cat wanted to go out. When we'd unlock the door, and he would go down the outdoor metal stairs to find his cat friends and play. I commuted to my college every day by walking 30 minutes to a bus stop, then riding the bus for an hour, and then walking another 10 minutes until I made it to campus. And when it was time to go home, I'd have to do the same thing all over again. So as you can imagine, it was very tiring. I would be out of the house every day from 10 in the morning until almost 10 at night. So when I'd come home, I'd be knackered. I don't believe in premonitions much, but I do believe in instinct, and for quite a while, I felt like something was up with the patch of forest behind our apartment. I felt watched. Maybe it was the blackness of the patch of forest that made me feel uneasy, but there wasn't a single light there, and the outdoor ladder looked like it descended into an abyss. You could take three steps into that patch of forest and you'd be under complete cover of darkness. It made me feel weird, because even though I couldn't see anything, I knew that something was up. I had no proof, but I knew it. I was in class one Wednesday afternoon with my best friend at the time, and a professor came in to pitch an internship to us. Internships aren't very well known in my country. So, professors actually have to argue their case about why, as students, we could benefit from this. My best friend, I'll call her Kay, was very interested. But when the professor listed off the requirements, she realized she couldn't apply, as her GPA wasn't high enough. This led to Kay having a crying fit after the class was over, which led to a panic attack and it got so bad that she called her boyfriend to come pick her up from campus. And since I didn't want to leave her alone, I stayed with her until her boyfriend showed up and got in his car with her. The conversation in the car was basically me and her boyfriend trying to console her and help cheer her up. I asked her if she'd like me to go over to her place so we could all hang out, but she said that was okay and didn't want to put me through the hassle of commuting home the next day. She lives a full hour away by car, so two hours away by public transport. So it was decided that they would drop me off to my house and they'd go to theirs. We got to my house at around 1900, a full three hours before I normally come home. I hug her tell her to text me if she needs anything, and I thank her boyfriend and I get out of the car, glad that I'll be home early for a change. 
I went in through the main entrance, climbed up the stairs to the first floor, and put my key in the lock. I opened the door and called out my brother's name like I always did, and I got no response. The house was dark except for one light in the room where the front door opened into, and eerily quiet. But I felt my stomach tie into a knot, because even if I couldn't hear anything, I could feel that something was there, and when my instinct talks, I listen. I turned right into the hallway that leads into our rooms, and I saw my brother's door slam shut hard as soon as I got in the hallway. My brother's room is on the end of the hallway, on the left, facing my own room, which is on the right of the hallway. My first thought was that my brother had taken a shower and forgotten to get a towel, so he made a run for it from the bathroom, which is next to my room, in embarrassment. But then I heard muffled whispers coming from his room, sounded hushed and pressing. I still had no reason to be afraid, but I was on high alert, because I thought my brother and his friends were planning on jumping out of his room and scaring me, and I wasn't about to let them get the satisfaction. So I inched down the short hallway through the darkness, and before I knock on my brother's door, I take a look at my room. It was an effing mess. My mattress was off my bed. My clothes and my books were all over the floor. My jewelry box was empty and thrown on my bed. All in all, it looked like a tornado had gone through there. And the hushed whispers in the next room sounded extremely pressing and anxious now that I was close. Because though I had tried to tiptoe as quietly as possible... My steps had still been audible. I realized what was happening, and I went ballistic. At that moment, I effing lost it. My fight-or-flight instinct kicked in, and it kicked fight into maximum overdrive. The words danger, thieves, fight hit me like a truck, and I threw my whole weight onto my brother's door, busting the door down. So furiously, you'd think it owed me money. I saw no one in the room, but it was also a freaking mess, and I knew what I had heard. So I ran to the balcony door. I ripped the curtain out of my way and went through the open balcony door just in time to catch one of the thieves right after he jumped off the balcony ledge. Looking back on it, he looked like a normal guy, Black hair, normal height, athletic, build, big earring in his left ear. But at the time, he looked like a freaking monster to me. A vile, putrid, home-invading, piece-of-shit thief monster. I started screaming unintelligible things as I saw him stumble around, obviously having hurt his legs before he got back on his feet and ran away. They were gone. I was safe, but then it hit me. Where the fuck was my laptop? I ran into my room and tore the place apart looking for my laptop. It was gone. I started screaming and crying. The unfairness, audacity, and the cowardice hit me like a stilled toe to the stomach. I screamed and cried like I was in a Grecian tragedy. I am not rich by any means, and neither is my family. I had an old laptop, which was presumably worth pennies second hand. But I needed that laptop for my schoolwork, and without it, I couldn't finish my semester. Not to mention that I don't have many real-life friends, and the majority of my friends at the time were online. So if I lost the laptop, I lost them too. My laptop was lost. And so was I. I felt violated, dirty, and less than. I was afraid I'd throw up or pass out or both. I was taking such rapid and deep panic breaths that my vision began to blur. In the most panicked and grief-stricken state I have ever been in in my life, tears streaming down my face, I called my mother to tell her what had happened and she told me to call the police. 
It took me almost a full minute on the phone with the operator, telling her again and again where I lived, who I was, and what had happened before she understood me and said she'd send someone straight over. A few days later, I was talking with my mother about the incident, and she told me something that hit me hard. I come from a pretty much trilingual household, and she told me that when I looked her that night, she couldn't make out what language I was speaking because I was so panicked. Makes sense why. I had to repeat myself over and over to the operator. I started running around the house like a lunatic, checking every door and every lock in a frenzy until I got to the kitchen and saw that the window had been broken. Without thinking, I slammed it shut. Stupid, I know. But I was beside myself. I wasn't thinking straight. My brother came home a few minutes later, and when he came in, he saw me panicked, crying my eyes out and speaking almost unintelligibly. He came to the bedrooms and he saw the damage and told me to go sit in the living room and calm down. I did as he said and tried to calm down, but I jumped at every sound and started crying worse, telling him I was sorry that I got home too late and that our laptops were gone. The house seemed so big to me at those moments, so dark and so hostile, and I felt so small and helpless. My brother called me over to my room and showed me a pillowcase full of something. And when we looked inside, we found both laptops, all my jewelry, fake, all of it, my old phone and some other stuff. They had been right in front of me the whole time, but I was so messed up that it didn't even register. The police eventually came about an hour later and did not a damn thing. So my brother and I took it to the police station and filed a report of the incident. And since I had seen half of one of the culprit's faces, they asked me to join in for an identification. They even sent over someone to dust for prints. Nothing ever came of it. The police said that since they didn't even have a backpack to put the loot in and resorted to using one of our pillowcases, they were almost 100% junkies. We had the outdoor metallic ladder ripped off our kitchen balcony, much to my cat's displeasure, since that's how he got in. We also installed several motion-detecting lights. For the next few months, I was constantly on edge, and every time I passed near some suspicious characters who hang around near my usual bus stop, I felt a violent rage boil within me. I caught myself looking for the man I had seen, ready to beat him within an inch of his life. But I never saw him or heard his creepy whisper partner again. And my brother and I moved away from that apartment a few months later because I never felt comfortable in that apartment again. I picked up kickboxing and because it has made me stronger, it has helped me feel safer, and I also always carry a knife with me now. I still think back on that encounter and realize how effing stupid I was. What creeps me out the most is knowing that that night there had been nothing but a thin plywood door separating me from two potentially dangerous men. Even if I know that me busting in my brother's room like a lunatic is what scared them off because of how stupidly fearless I was, I also realized how bad it could have gone. They could have had guns. They could have had knives. They could have had pepper spray or a chain or whatever. And there were two of them and only one of me. And if they had ganged up on me, even with the adrenaline having turned into a doom guy... I don't know how much of a chance I realistically stood against two men, high on whatever they were on, and desperate enough to break into an apartment and stuff loot into a pillowcase. Had they been willing to put up a fight, this would have ended very, very badly for me. What I do know was that I probably still would have bust in there like Doom Guy. So, to the creepy, cowardly bastards 
who dared break into my apartment and tried to rob me and my brother and ended up traumatizing me so bad I had to move. Fuck you both. I hope for your sake we never meet again because I've been kicking that sandbag for two years now and picturing your face every single time. It happened eight years ago, during the summer. A little backstory there. I was at my mom's house, but she barely lived there anymore. She spent most of her time at her boyfriend's. And my sister was very often left alone. I was a student in another city, but I came back to my house during the holidays. I was 19 and my sister was 16 at the time. Our house had two floors living room and kitchen on the first floor, three bedrooms and a bathroom on the second floor. The kitchen and the living room had two door windows opening on a large terrace. From the terrace, you could go in the backyard by some steps. We didn't really use the ground floor as it was very dark due to the small windows, and it was basically a garage and an office to do our homework. Like I said, it was summer, very hot. I just discovered Game of Thrones and I had two seasons to watch. Every evening I took my laptop, made myself comfortable on the terrace near the kitchen and watched an episode or ten. My garden was surrounded by a U-shaped building so you could see very well my terrace and my garden from the balconies. Some working men were there for about a couple of days now and were working late, so I often see them while I watch my series in the evening. They were minding their own business, and so did I, so I didn't think much of it. One morning I was sleeping late, and my sister woke me up whispering, Wake up! There's a man in the house! I was half naked because of the heavy heat of the summer. I stood up, perfectly awake now, and grabbed a shirt and went downstairs practically running. I know this is a dumb thing to do, a half-naked, helpless young woman, but I am very protective with my little sister, and I didn't feel any fear at this point. I went down to the kitchen, couldn't find a sharp knife, so I took a fork. Absurd, I know. While I asked her where she'd seen him at, she told me she was watching TV in the living room, and because the windows were open, she saw a man in the reflection standing just behind her. She jumped off the couch and found herself in front of him, a tall man in his late thirties. She had no chance in a fight. The guy had one of his feet on the first step to the second floor where I was sleeping. She shouted, Who are you? He didn't answer, and just walked quietly back in the kitchen where the door window was wildly open and took the steps back into the garden. As soon as I heard that, I ran in the backyard with my harmless weapon to my gate in front of our garden. I even went in the street looking for him. I'm sure if I had found him, I would have not been so brave anymore and would have probably pissed myself, but, well no one. Suddenly, I realized my sister was still alone in the house, and maybe that creep was in there too. I went back to the kitchen, searched the house, but thank God we were alone. This is when I saw my computer was missing. My sister told me that the guy didn't have anything in his hand when he left. That was the scariest part, because it meant either he was in the house for quite some time before, took the laptop and came back to do whatever the hell he planned to do, or there was another person in here. I put some decent clothes on and took my sister to the police station nearby. I'm very angry with the policeman. She was a minor, so stayed with her. She told them everything and described the guy in a lot of details. They asked her, Could you recognize him? And she said, Yes, without a doubt. They said, 
you know it's highly unlikely we find him. You should be thankful you and your sister haven't been sexually assaulted. Like she needed to be more frightened than she already was. They wrote in the disposition that she was too shaken up and could not recognize the man, even though she said the contrary multiple times. We never heard from them. When we came back to the house, she was very, very scared, and I was very pissed off with the loss of my very expensive laptop. I needed it for art school, and I had all of my photos in there and the attitude of the police. We both sat in the terrace and talked about what had happened and how lucky we were she saw that man before he came upstairs. This is when I noticed the working men weren't there anymore. From the streets, no one can ever know we have a backyard and another entry into the house. My sister told me it was acting like he knew a bit of the house. Maybe it was the first time and we didn't notice. We never know. I'm certain it was one of those men working in that neighbor's balcony who has been watching me that broke in that morning. From that day, we doubled down locking the doors and slept in the same bed for two weeks. So, freaky worker guy, because I know it's you, I hope we never meet again. Hello everyone, I will try to keep this as concise as possible while still delving into necessary details. I am looking for answers to these terrifying events that have altered my daily routine tremendously as I'm currently living in fear. This happened in a span of two days, five days ago. I'm not sure if these events are connected, however, I'm convinced they are. I am an 18-year-old dude, 6 foot 1, 190 pounds. I live in Seattle and I work at a local grocery store as my father insisted on me getting a job amidst coronavirus and grocery stores are the very few places hiring nowadays. Anyway, I worked at 5 a.m. and wake up at around 4 a.m. I don't mind it because I get off early. It's still dark when I arrive at the store and I always have to call the store and ask for the produce workers to let me in. As I was walking up to the door, I see an average looking guy, probably late thirties. He doesn't work at my store and clearly he was tweaking out, moving around in crazy motions, on math or something. It was common to find needles in the bathroom of our store. As I was waiting for the door to be opened, he was facing me about eight feet away, not looking at me, but past me. He was chanting some weird satanic shit, something like, Satan will come, Satan knows. He kept repeating those lines. I was just standing at the door like, what the hell is this dude on? Someone just let me inside already, hurry up. Nothing else strange happens at work that day, and I get off at 9 a.m. as I only worked a four-hour shift that day. As I'm driving home, I get a call, and the ID said it was from a nearby city. I answer, and I literally just hear a guy breathing. I'm just sitting there thinking, this is some corny prank. Since the audio was playing through the speakers of my car, his breathing was amplified, so I'm not sure if it was intentional. I read one time that if someone keeps you on the phone for long enough, they can get your IP address. I'm not certain of this, though. He then says my full name in a tone of a question, but also in a weird, strangely excited kind of way that made me feel extremely uneasy. This was very stupid of me to confirm it was, but... I said, yeah, who is this? And then he just pauses and hangs up. I realized a few hours later that he sounded exactly alike to that satanic dude from this morning, except sober. I get paranoid fairly easily, 
but this was a red flag and sent chills down my spine. I tried to call back and the number was, you guessed it, disconnected. The next day I arrived at work with no troubles and leave at 9 a.m. I get home at about 9.20. I see my father's car in the driveway as he is usually home at this time. The front door to my house was unlocked. I shouldn't think anything of this because my dad was home, right? I walk in, take off my shoes, and call out for my dad because I brought in his mail. So before I explain this next part, you need to understand that many noises people hear are misidentified as something it is truly not, or their mind is playing games on them, or it's just the house making noises, etc., but there is a very specific noise that my parents' bed frame makes because it's wood, when somebody is rolling around in it. I knew this sound very well because my room is right next to my parents and my dad is an extremely light sleeper, and any time I drop something or make a relatively loud sound, I can hear him rolling around in his bed because I disturbed him. Okay, continuing on. I call out for my dad as I'm walking up the stairs, and there is no response, only that noise of the bed frame moving. I later that day rolled around in the bed to confirm the noise I heard, and that you need a significant amount of weight on the bed in order to produce the sound. This is when I got scared as hell, because my dad wakes up very early, and there is no way he was taking a nap at 9.30 a.m. I'm already at the top of the stairs at this point, so I burst into my room and closed my door. I listened through our paper-thin walls, and I genuinely heard someone whispering, and then the springs releasing as if somebody was sitting on the edge and stood still. If he was whispering, that means there could potentially be two people in my house and I could be in real danger. I instinctively grabbed the dresser and dragged it in front of my door. That thing weighs probably at least 150 pounds, and it took me a little while to drag it in front of my door. My heart was pounding. I was worried the intruder or intruders would catch on to what I was doing and break through the door before I had the chance to do it. I just slammed the dresser down in front of the door to not waste any more time. Nobody was getting through that door. I felt slightly more relaxed and called my dad. I started to get nervous because he didn't answer, but he sometimes went on walks around the neighborhood at this time. Just as I tried to call him, I saw him walking up the street from out of my bedroom window and shouted that it wasn't safe for him to come into the house. At first, he laughed it off and proceeded up the driveway, as nothing like this has ever happened, and we live in a somewhat safe area. I repeated myself, but this time I screamed at him. Now he knew I was serious. He could see the fear in my eyes. I stepped back a few feet and asked what the hell was going on and I felt I didn't really have time to explain and just told him to wait. Once I confirmed my father was safe, I called 911 and the intruder or intruders next to me must have heard it because once I got off the phone, they ran down the stairs. I was scared for my dad at this point because he was just right outside. I had to move the dresser again from my door as I was in a panic state and I left my room and ran downstairs to see nothing except my dad, who was still confused and pointed out that the back door was wide open. The cops got there about 12 minutes later and came up with nothing. No evidence of forcible entry, literally nothing, besides the wide open back door and some mud tracked into the house, which really pissed me off. Could the man whispering been the man who was talking to Satan the other day? How did that man know my name on the phone? Can someone track you if they know your phone number and full name? Were these people trying to abduct me? 
This happened only five days ago, and I've been scared ever since, worrying they might come back. I also have sleep paralysis, and it has gotten worse lately. And if you've had it before, yeah, it effing sucks. That's my story. I hope nothing like this happens to any of you. Thank you for listening. And to the satanic worshiper, let's not ever meet again, dude. An incident happened over the Christmas break when I was working late at my job. There's been a spat of recent kidnapping attempts where my parents live, but I was still determined stupidly to not let that stop me from working the late shifts. My shift ended at 3, and none of my colleagues drove, at least no one on that shift did. So I ended up walking. The pub I work in is on the seafront and is close to a lot of clubs and bars. So it's often swarmed with people, so it feels safe to walk downtown. But the further in town you get, the darker it gets and the less people there are. Not even cars drive through very often. There's a weight rose on the corner that leads up towards my road, and it has a few high walls surrounding it and I could see three guys jumping along the wall. They'd been the pub I worked in a few hours before, drinking, so I recognized them as I had served them. As I walked past them, they shouted at me. I had my earphones in, but they weren't playing music, so I could hear what was said. My mom always tells me that since I walk alone at night, I shouldn't listen to music and I'd never listened to her before this Christmas break, and so I put them in but never listened to anything. As I passed by them, not answering them, of course, they muttered something about following me. I never experienced a moment of anxiety quite as intense as I did in the moment of hearing that, and then seeing their shadows sticking close behind me on the road was adrenaline pumping. After the two roads and a moment of clarity, I thought to call someone or at least pretend to be on the phone, and so I tried calling my mom, but she didn't answer. Though this seemed to do the trick, and I saw them turn on their heels and walk briskly in the opposite direction. When I was around the corner from my house, I called the police, thinking about the recent kidnappings and assaults that had been occurring. I thought it was a good idea to call the police and report it. And though I was still rattled, I managed to be coherent enough to begin a report. A day later, I finished the report and the police told me that no one was found in the area and nobody had reported anything else, so I felt relieved in regards to that they haven't appeared to hurt anyone else. I have never had anything that terrifying in my life happened, at least in the sense of I have never properly been followed by someone late at night. I've had people follow me around shops and the town during the day and I could shrug it all off, but nothing like that in the early morning alone on the streets. Stay safe out there guys, and don't walk at night with earphones in. I certainly won't be doing that again. To those kids or young adults, you won't have a bright future heading down the path that you're heading down. I hope I never see you again. And that, dear listeners, brings an end to these true Let's Not Meet stories. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.